tie and get your hair cut way up high. Get yourself a lawyer, son. You're gonna need a real good one. We all need a good lawyer from time to time, but uh, your usual good lawyer is away because it's Cup Day. David Whiting is having a break, so we thought we'd have a special look at business law with Matthew Karakoulakis. He's a principal solicitor at AMK Law, and we thought we'd talk about contracts, startups, intellectual property, dispute resolution between businesses, all that kind of stuff. Give us a call. one three hundred triple two seven seven four. 777 4 Business law really uh, traverses a wide area of interests and we'd love to hear your questions, your need for help. one three hundred triple two seven seven four. 777 4 Matthew, good morning and uh, welcome to Mornings. Uh, thank you very much. It's a uh, great pleasure to be here. Yeah, no, it's great to have you on board. So tell us about the work that you do, do in commercial law. Sure. So um, at AMK Law, we've uh, spent more than, uh, we're in our seven, 2014 we started. So yep. just about to be in our, uh, what's that, seventh year, mm-hmm. I think, sixth or seventh year. Um, but the point is that uh, at our firm, we focus on uh, commercial law, dispute resolution, uh, and we do some property law matters as well. Our commercial law is very exciting. It covers uh, the startup business space. Um, that can be anything to do with structuring a business, uh, intellectual property issues. Yep. Uh, it can be acquiring significant assets in the more developed style of business. And we also do a lot of work in the uh, commercial litigation space. So I would imagine. Yeah. yeah. And there'd be a fair bit about banking and financing as well, I would imagine. Absolutely. I think yeah. uh, every successful business needs to have their eyes in the books and needs to have the finances in place as well. And how did you get into law? I got into law, I remember as a young boy walking down the uh, the street, one of the main streets in Adelaide, um, in Hyde Park with my mum and dad. And I said, mum, dad, when I grow up, I want to be a very good martial artist. I want to play AFL football and I want to be a great lawyer. And I was about eight years old, I think, when I, when I said that. <laughs> um, in that order? Martial artist, AFL player, and then lawyer. Ah, uh, it was probably probably lawyer first, or yeah. I, I know from a very very young age, I was extremely strong in my vision of being a fantastic lawyer. Was it in your family? Uh, no, it wasn't. I'm actually the first person uh, from my family to have gone to a university. Oh, so wow. that's I'm always a really great. Your parents must have been so proud. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So how did the footy career go? First of all, we'll take that. That off. one was a big cross. Okay, um, right. I, I I played some good football when I was younger, and then sort of gave up football when I was about seventeen years old. So martial artist. What did you do? I think that one I've done well. Um, really? I yeah, I got my brown belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu this year, which is fantastic. Congratulations. Yeah, and um, it's a big part of my work day. Uh, most lunch times I go to the, the martial arts gym and get in the training session, which is fantastic in terms of clearing the mind and getting back into business. So how fantastic! Yeah. And it means also that you can defend your clients should you need to. If you know push came to shove, oh, there's there's some amazing principles that carry over from you know martial arts into being a great lawyer. Tell me, some of those great principles are well, one one thing is process. So. If anyone's ever been involved in a legal dispute, you can realise that going to court is very process-based. Yeah. So you're either the quote-unquote good guy or the bad guy or girl. And it starts off with finding a court document. You'll get a notice back from the court. There'll be steps in all that process all the way to the end of having the end trial. And martial arts, is to me, is, is exactly the same. You have one step after the other after the other. But that's just one aspect where they're similar. I actually wrote an article earlier this year that got published online. Um, so if anyone's interested in reading... <laughs> about Zen and the art of litigation and martial arts. It's about how Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu has helped me to become a better lawyer. I love it. Matthew Karakulakis is a principal solicitor at AMK Law. He's a brown belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and he knows his stuff. If you have a question that you'd like to ask him about any aspect of commercial or business law or litigation or advice, contracts, startups, contracts, we could fill out an entire program with contract disputes, goodness, IP, dispute resolution, litigation, do give us a call, one three hundred triple two seven seven four. 777 Kevin is in Geelong. Kevin, you're first up speaking to Matthew. Good morning. 
Fantastic. Thanks, Virginia, again for the opportunity to ask you a question. Matt, I just wanted to ask you about the, the, the law surrounding unconscionable conduct in regard to trade practices in Australia. Do you have any idea of how, how, how many prosecutions have been and what's the, what's the hurdle for the test? But my interest is in the area of competition law, for example, where you've got oligo- oligopolistic behaviour where big, big businesses beat up at small businesses yes. without penalty. Yes, I understand. Um, that, so the first point on that is how many prosecutions? I really don't know the number of prosecutions. I can tell you it's close to zero. Yeah, that's, that's not a big surprise. Um, I think those prosecutions are definitely within the mandate of the ACCC. I think the H, from what I see, the, in my view, the ACCC does some good work. They definitely have a heavy stick and a lot of power in terms of enforcing uh, the Australian consumer law and there's provisions within the Australian consumer law that uh, deal with the uh, unconscionable conduct requirements so basically ensuring mm. that there's no exploitation um, from one party to another Kevin the point that you made about the um, you know larger business to smaller business um, scenario there was a case last year JJ Richards uh, was involved in that case. It's the big company. It was about the. Um, it's a big waste collection company. Exactly. Yeah. And if you, I, I actually never heard of, or well, never consciously heard of JJ Richards. It's amazing how many brands there are out there. Yeah. And you just sort of, you might see them day to day, but you just never focus. You never, on you it. never click. Yes. I, I've never looked closely on rubbish bins, for example. <laughs> and then since I come across the case, I've just seen JJ Richards everywhere. Yeah. And they are a, a very big. Big company. commercial. Yeah. Yes. Uh, uh, waste contractor. Yes. And, and so what happened? What happened was um, there was a landmark case where um, standard form contracts uh, were held to be enforceable uh, against a large company. So essentially if there's a clause in a, in a contract that um, is in a standard form contract and meets the requirements that were set down the court, by the court in the case, mm-hmm. then um, the large company can't actually enforce that contract. So that's something that I think is really helpful for small business owners to keep in mind, particularly when dealing with the large companies. Kevin, thanks for calling in. Brendan in Croydon, good morning to you. Oh, good morning, Virginia and Go. Matt. Thanks very much for taking me call. Uh, I've got a question regarding um, having a name taken off a lease. Uh, it's a dual partnership and um, one half hasn't contributed anything at all financially and walked out 12 months ago. We've um, uh, done uh, necessaries through the Government Gazette, etc., but I'm just wondering if there's any other avenues. Sure, that's a great question, Brendan. When you say the name of the lease, is it a commercial lease? Yeah, yeah it's um, a commercial lease, yeah. Yeah. So sometimes the leases contain clauses about terminating a lease and... Since you say it's a commercial lease, there can be some more complexity and some quite a bit of variation in commercial leases and the, and the termination clauses. But if the, if you've got a good relationship with the landlord, the landlord, and depending on your circumstances, the landlord might enable you to enter into a new lease and terminate the current one. Um, yeah, there's um, small complex uh, problems with that. Uh, we do have a good relationship with the landlord, but um, the um, other side doesn't. Yes, but you say the other side has not been contactable and has not been in contact with them for ages, right? Yeah, and that's with the landlord as well. Well, d- does that mean then, Matthew, it still doesn't mean they couldn't go ahead and terminate the current arrangement with the with the, the landlord, does it? Yes, that's what I'm saying. It depends yeah. on the, the lease and the actual circumstances that Brennan's involved in. Yeah. but. Yeah, I, this, I gather the situation with the other partner and the landlord is that there's monies owed there separately. So uh, I think they're viewing it as uh, like a ransom, not changing the lease. Sure. So, Brendan, one of the reasons why I've given the option of seeing if you can essentially transfer transfer the lease into your own name or your company name or to another party's name mm. or even terminate the current lease is because there's commercial um, 
considerations as well as the complexities to do with money's owed and things like that in your situation mm. without having reviewed the lease it's very hard to say exactly what needs to be done but if you are able to either uh, agree with the landlord to terminate the lease and have the landlord pursue yep. the other person separately I mean that, or, or or terminate and enter into a new lease. I mean, they're good ways that you can effectively achieve the outcome that you is, want. Is that the only way? That'd be the ideal way. Yes. No, no, no. I'm, I'm asking Matthew the, here. Sorry. Is that the only way the that, o- uh, that uh, Brendan can do this? The other way would be. I mean, there's there are a number of ways, but it depends That's on the Brendan's situation. That's the easiest way. Another way could be transferring the lease from one entity to another. When you say there's a person's name that is on the lease. Um, if they are an individual, they could transfer the lease to you, for example, yep. but they're not contactable. So, so you, you can't, Brendan, really you hard. can't find them at all? No, they, um, no, no uh, they've changed the phone number and the, they don't answer emails. And they clearly don't want to be found because of the money owing separately to the uh, landlord or because there's other money is owing to you or, or other people? Both. Right, okay. And ge- and generally, Brendan, it's in the landlord's interest to um, terminate the current lease if that is possible mm. in your circumstances uh, okay. because then that way you're on the hook and they know exactly where the money's coming from for yeah. the rent payments. Good luck. Um, maybe having a conversation with the landlord might be the right way to go. Our number is 1300 222 774. Thank you for calling in. Good to hear from you. If you'd like to ask any business or commercial law questions about contracts, about property dispute resolution, as we've just heard there, or transferring of leases. Well, what are the big issues that uh, preoccupy you at the moment, Matthew? What are, what are the, the majority of cases that are brought to you? Yep. So at the moment, we've got a couple of um, cases gearing up for trial in the federal court um, t- to kick off on the 9th of December. About? Um, they are to do with a contract misrepresentation um, and, yeah, they're just sort of thinking. Yeah, I know you have to be careful here. I get that. Yes. <laughs> yeah. um, and uh, as you go through the, the litigation and preparing for that, I've often wondered, um, does the, the story that you're, you're brought initially, and I know you have to be careful here. I'll ask my question carefully. Uh, the story that, that's or the issue, the case that's brought to you by your client, and as you dig in and, and brief other counsel and, and, and do your due diligence and, and uh, your discovery to prepare for litigation, do the stories change substantially and the facts change substantially as you drill into it? That's a terrific question, uh, Virginia, and... I think it depends on the client and the case you're working on. I say it's a terrific question. It was very well timed this morning. I was, uh, you know, sort of getting ready to go to work and I was thinking about one of the cases we're working on where the client has asked me pretty much the same five questions for about two years. Mm-hmm. And it's that I think that's really interesting because often cases can be so complex you mentioned the word discovery which is which is so time consuming particularly in today's day and age of electronic communication mm. once upon a time a letter might be sent every few months these days you can have 10 emails in a day so we've got uh, one of the cases at the moment has got you know well, tens if not hundreds of thousands of documents we're still getting the final calculation documents together all of which get printed out which really can't be good for paper use as well exactly yeah. and and um, there's so many inefficiencies in all of that. But one of the things mm. that we're focusing on in our firm at AMK Law is being real innovative in our approach. So one example of that is we avoid much as much of that printing as possible. We, al- we almost have a pa- completely paperless office, despite the thousands and hundreds of thousands of documents that can exist in cases. You'd want to try and be, go paperless if you certainly can. Uh, we've got a call I can bring you in just a moment, I think, from... Um True and coming in. Uh, Matthew Karakalakis is Principal Solicitor at AMK Law, who's taking your questions and giving some advice this morning on business and commercial law. Nick is in Drew and hello, good morning. Oh, good morning. Go ahead. Um, I've got uh, a friend who's in a partnership in a shop. They, they just lease the shop. Uh, it's not going very well. They've decided to part their ways. The other partner's going to continue in the shop. They want the partner that is leaving the shop to sign a 
document that says that they basically the other part, the partner can't go and work in another shop in the area. I can understand where they might be restricted. A little, a little non-compete. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. just a work thing rather than set up another business. Mm-hmm. Is this lady able to go and work in another shop in the area? Matthew? That's, that's, that's a uh, fantastic question, Nick. And essentially what you're talking about is having an agreement that contains a restraint of trade. Um, restraint of trade clauses are very, very difficult to enforce. Some lawyers say that they actually can't be enforced. My view is, yes, you can definitely enforce a restraint of trade. And there's some strong case law in Australia to support that notion. But by the mere fact, Nick, that I've started answering your question with this does raise concerns whenever trying to enforce a restraint because Mm. as a minimum, they're very hard to enforce. Um, Unless you've signed a formal non-compete. So... Can can the person go and just work in another shop or... Is there, is there a, straight back, uh, a straightforward answer to that, Matthew? So the straightforward answer, it's difficult without seeing the clause, without I knowing the circumstances. Yeah, sure. All that's very difficult. The straightforward answer is be careful because the restraint uh, probably isn't enforceable because they're difficult to enforce. They are difficult to enforce. Nick in Drew, and good luck to you and your mate. Great to talk to you this morning, Matthew. Thanks for taking time for us. Matthew Karakoulakis is the Principal Solicitor at AMK Law.